Oh, hey, everyone. Um, hello. Uh, if you can, uh, please sign in if you haven't already. Um, welcome to the Imagine series, the Student Showcase. Um, I'm Felix Grigorswitz, but today isn't uh, about me at all. We will be focusing on our wonderful undergrad writers. Um, so if we could just have a round of applause for all of them. And without further ado, we'll begin um, with Keika Berger. Um, please come up. Hi. Um, today I have three short little poems to read. Um, the first one is A Golden Shovel, which for those of you who don't know, um, a golden shovel poem is when the last word of every line in the poem spells out a line from another poem, typically a Gwendolyn Brooks poem. Um, so the poem that I took my line from is called An Aspect of Love Alive in the Ice and Fire by Gwendolyn Brooks. And the line that I took as well as the title of my poem is A Physical Light is in the Room. At what age do we ripen? In the late morning, you are a young boy having mama button your shirt. By noon, you are yearning for the physical. In the early evening, you have your first kiss, the fading light transforming the interior of your parents' car into a bright red oven. Is that why it's so hot? Late evening comes around, and you are finally inside of her. It is a different girl from earlier, but the end is the same. As night draws to a close, you are alone. All light leaves the pitch black room. Um, the second poem that I have is called In Loving Memory. Greta greets me at the door of the funeral home, black pantsuit and clear high heels, neon green toenails peeking out. Greta gently takes my coat and leads me to the main room, her mother lying in a casket up front. She hands me a prayer card. Greta's entire family is in the room, a crowd of blonde hair and blue eyes and porcelain skin. She leads me to the pictures of her mom, each one adorned with googly eyes. Greta laughs and says, Gunnar had to be taken home because he had stuck eyes on all the pictures of his mother. His father laughs tearfully and says that four-year-olds don't know any better. Someone tells Greta they're sorry. Greta tells them it's okay, it's just a body. And the last poem I have to read is a found poem. It's actually a cento, um, which is when every line from the poem is taken from a line of another poem. So I have poets in here ranging from uh, Nate Marshall to Ocean Vuong, uh, Patricia Smith, Amanda Gorman. And it is titled, Praise the Softness of Skin. Heat has a way of stretching time. His hand running the hem of her white dress Mesmerized by the split of skirts, she opens, far from polished, far from pristine. Neither wind nor ice nor time is a match for the memory of fire. Praise the sleek symmetry of smoke. The hotel rocks beneath them, a force that would shatter. What if the mightiest word is love? Thank you. Thank you. I love the googly eyes over the picture of the mother, a very beautiful detail. Um, next up, we have Guy. Hi. Um, so this is an excerpt uh, from a chapter of a novel. Wake up. You're seven. You're seven and you've woken up to the milky darkness of mi midnight, the thick, creamy experience of in and out of dream. Your body is light, but the smooth cool of the covers weighs down, pressing this half you into the plush give of the bed. But wake up. You're seven and you're falling. You're falling. You're falling fast. The rest of the room revolts away from you as the plush gives out into the heavy revolution and there's no hardwood floor smack to catch your wet with bed sweat body back against wake up. You're seven and you fight this falling so hard you fly. The covers can't catch you on the over and upswing as you fall forward through and out of the dull muffled rumble in your ears and into the not silence of wake up. You're seven and your body jerks itself still in the moving room and until you open up into the night. You are not soothed by the on the ground 
sound, the susurrus rush of wind winnowing between bedewed green, the raucous chorus of rupturing ribbits, crackling croaks, and the cascading clamor of summer cicadas. You've woken up. Set up in bed, you can only see the undefined outline of things throughout the room. Blue shapes against the blue depths, blue dim and darker. And so you're awake. And the thought first, the shadow of the thought you feel on your chest. The dull pads of its fingers press into your bloodless, unbeaten heart and pull down, down, down into the empty drop off of your weightless stomach. The thought is in your pale, shivering peripheral. And with your seventh comprehension, you think, I'm going to die. This is the thought, darker and heavier than its shadow, and as unobservable as the direct light of a dawn dawn or dusk dun sun. The thought is felt by its absent presence. It's simply not. You imagine that around that which you cannot imagine, and all the opposite sensation you feel is your inability to grasp the thought alone as you fall with nothing to hold and no wake up will end this because you are awake. You are awake now and you check the time. It's not midnight and so you're not actually seven yet. For two years you've had this thought lying awake at night before you check the time and for two years you've cried out soft murder into an otherwise resigned midnight silence down and across the hall to mom. She either comes to you or you go to her. She'll tell you which, sweetheart, and you'll feel loved, warmed, and okay now with her. But before you call out to her and as you call out to her and after you know mom can't change the truth, I'm going to die. You'll think it again nuzzled into her embodied benevolence. She's so nice and you'll think it under the seraph of her breath. What's worse is the thinking after the thought, I'm going to die. Then you strain your soon-to-be seventh imagination, picturing different shades of black, holding your breath and muffling your ears. You lie in bed awake most nights and think this, this, I'm going to die. And even if I call out for mom, though she'll make me feel better enough to fall asleep, she won't change that I'm going to die. There aren't as many tears from the immediacy of the thought as there used to be. There's nothing you can say or do. You've adapted. The only catharsis from fear of dying is death. You know you have to go. Not now, please not now, no. Tonight, or maybe this morning you check the clock again, is different because of tomorrow. You will call out for her, mom. Why? Because there's nothing else you could do. Soft murder sits in your mouth. You feel buried under the dark dirt of night quiet. You hum the M. As you brave the M.O., you hear the tiny crackles and crumbles of dust clearing from your throat. You pause, afraid to swallow the afterward shatter. Mom? You call it again, like that. Mom, you're so weak, but your weakness is enough. You hear the shuffle of covers and in hushed interparental discussion. Thank you, the relentless pace of being seven. Um, next up we have Christina Faber. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, I'll be reading two poems today, and this first one is titled Dying. I will try flying on a fast airplane, shredding through clouds that filter sunshine, ignoring rain as it drops with ignorance. Creation doesn't care about my existential crises. Angels and devils will dance at the sight of a nervous woman itching at her neck. They feed off her unknowingness, unfold at her questionings, spread salt on words until they smoke and cause a fire. I can see it from here, flames growing until grass turns to ash. The wing traps heat and crawls towards the body, a festival for spirits who reject the rainy spray. Falling from a shadow wasn't how I shaped my death. The snake from the window spitting on my neck reminds me that God left remains of the damned on the right side of my wrists. Scars spell out across and in initials of my hell carrier, the ominous letters being half my own name, the man who brings my corpse to the beginning of a life he controls. Light finally leaves the sky as my father seizes my flamed hand, dragging me to the world where crosses always bleed and daughters are designed to sing for his devil. And my second poem is called Elegy and is a huzzle for my grandfather. Inventing something new, like a bush without thorns, a rose with dew that falls like tears to a bed that's worn. Your roses were always red, sometimes pink and yellow too. For a flower that is airborne, roses flutter the garden like dandelions, growing like a friend next to hawthorns. Oh rose, you smell like something I've known before like the dust atop the painting of a horn, where roses cover the mantle and the instrument sings an entrance. You are as eternal as your firstborn, who rose above and became your petals. George, forever in a heart not time-worn, like a rose. Thank you. Thank you. I love the line, dust atop a painting of a horn, such a specific detail. Um, Caroline Gallagher is next. Hi. 
It's a little smaller. <laughs> Um, this is an excerpt from a piece called On Being Touchy-Feely. There's a reason why the stereotypical soulless job always involves staring at a computer screen for the better part of each week's daylight hours. For all the elation one might feel when a spreadsheet effortlessly performs a tedious calculation or a word processor recovers a document after your computer crashes, there's something undeniably unfulfilling about living and breathing digital work. At the risk of seeming like a pretentious Luddite, I feel compelled to say that I am not longing for the proverbial good old days when information was scarce and content undiversified, mostly because I've never lived in a time like that. I am infinitely grateful for the wealth of knowledge available to me online, but I still think the intangibility of so much of our lives might be affecting us in some way. The immediacy and virtuality of life in the two-hour delivery age has diluted the value of physical objects, and that value is something to which I desperately cling. I like to think this oppressive tactile cock block has prompted my affinity for very hands-on hobbies, admittedly a very post hoc ergo propter hoc sort of deal, but maybe that doesn't even matter. I want to hold the evidence of my labor in my hands to prove to others that, for as passively as I spend 40 hours of my week, for at least a moment in time, I am producing rather than consuming, developing rather than destroying. I am drinking in the divine intoxication of creating something from nothing. Interestingly enough, I couldn't care less about retaining the artifacts of my labor. Otherwise, I would probably suffocate under the weight of all the socks, hats, scarves, sweaters, blankets, and stuffed animals I have pawned off on friends and strangers. Instead of a pathological need to record my life, my response to incessant digitalization is an overwhelming addiction to physical manifestations of my connections with people. It seems almost unbearable to leave an art show invitation or a compliment on my guacamole just hanging there without commemorating the, the occasion in yarn or a frightfully effusive thank you note. I feel a longing for the physicality of things in a world in which my entertainment, my livelihood, and even my personal relationships could exist entirely within the confines of my laptop screen. It is for this reason that I have become something of a tactile maximalist, filling my walls with business cards and printed photos to serve as tangible evidence that I went places, did things, and met people on an all-encompassing, sensory-stimulating scale and surround sound. I lent my books out to the friends of mine who love to write down their thoughts as they read, and at the risk of scaring them away from their pens, I silently hope that they will forget themselves enough to take notes in my books. If my life and personality are ever-evolving collages of the people I love and spend time with, I want my possessions to be reliquaries of those people too. Perhaps it's a fear of the family history of Alzheimer's or the possibility of losing a loved one way too soon. Or maybe it's just good old-fashioned hoarding. But I want to see and touch and bathe in the time I have spent with others as much as I can. It's why I have a shrine to all of my dates with Julia, why I collect every post-it saying love you my dad sends to me in the mail while I'm at school, why my prized possessions are the t-shirts my boyfriend has grown out of and passed on to me. The jury's still out on whether I could stand to be publicly affectionate before a collection of my friends and loved ones, so instead of dedicating my girlish fantasies to planning my wedding day, I've devised a detailed plan for the funeral of my dreams. The guest list will be limited to those who have received something I've made. Even the individuals from the most distant past who are still in possession of a Carolina original are more than welcome. I imagine that everyone in attendance will be supporting, supporting the things I've made for them, and death is not as scary when the sea of black clothes and somber faces is peppered with crazy colored knit socks and rubber pig earrings. Thanks. Thank you for that uh, thoughtful exploration of uh, connection. Uh, next up, we have Justine Victoria. Hello. I have two poems today. The first one is about a cousin of mine who passed away. It's called Jen's Gemless Silver Ring. I wish I knew how important a moment could become before I let myself forget. But one short exchange of, here, let me show you. The sound of her feet waddling across the tacky floral tiles of her childhood bedroom, riddled with dust and rotten spider webs. The grazing of hands just before her fingertips could intertwine, the way they would when we used to bathe together, sharing a bar of soap and two pails of warm water. Then, she was 19, I was six. I can only imagine now the words that parted open her lips. Something along the lines of, it's yours if you like it. And there it was on my palm, dropped like a coin for a beggar. Bulgari, class A from a pawn shop. She collected watches, I, collect, I collected rings. A silver band wrapped itself around my finger. 
I hadn't yet known then that I had married a single chain, a spouse that had never left my side even when I bathed myself, on top of it a short cylinder that held the faux diamond, sitting pretty in its core with its legs open, ready to be chewed, and so I did, before I went to bed, on the train, when I didn't want to eat breakfast, when I watched her body at 35 get lowered down onto the earth, kissing and lapping my tongue around the silver until I had swallowed the gem. I like to think it settled in one of the many folds in my gut, digging a crater for itself, making a home, perhaps a mansion, although a hut would be fine. Maybe she, too, had started living in my stomach. There, they can be safe, away from mouths that want to feast on them. There, they can take care of each other. The second one that I have is called Elegy from the Unborn Baby in Her Stomach. From that first kiss, I knew she would kill me. The gardener scattered daffodil bulbs all over her garden in the early days of spring, when the wind still bit his ears and his fingers. He watered them just enough until they sprouted. Out from the dirt, screaming green leaves that huddled together, sharing a secret. But soon he forgot to weed her ground. He never did come back to do it. Granted, she could have done it herself with a hoe, a rake, even with her damn fingers. Instead, she waited for me to die, watching from the jealousy windows of her home. In her hand a glass, drinking acid like milk. The only and most love she could give was to kill me. Until I was 12 feet into the ground, she could not sleep. When she walked around her garden, she made sure to step on the soil from where I grew. She would caress the skin I lived in before hammering screws into it, spitting at it until my roots were wet with phlegm. But only because she loved me. And even after all that was left of me was dirt, she watched. Even when another gardener came to tend her land, she asked to leave my grave bare. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Emma Grimes. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my short story called Your Mother's Cancer Story. A few weeks after her diagnosis, she asked to talk to you. You went to her room and stood at the end of the bed. She asked you to sit, so you did. She told you to come closer, so you did. She told you that you looked beautiful in the blue light of the room, and you felt uncomfortable. She wasn't the same mother who stayed up late watching Carrie with you. She wasn't the same mother who gave you a bowl of chocolate ice cream in secret when your father told her not to. So, you told her you'd be back in a second because you wanted to get something from your room. You came back a minute later with yellow nail polish. You asked if you could paint them the way you used to, and she smiled. She didn't have the heart to tell you she wasn't allowed nail polish for her surgeries, so she let you paint them anyway. It was the same bottle you had before your 14th birthday, half of it gone. You used to paint her nails this hue of yellow because it matched her person so well. From a young age, you were poetic, but not poetic enough to make it a career, so you turned to psychology like your father. Your mother never got the chance to see, but she would have told you to go to school for English if given the chance, and you would have listened. But you made it a ritual to paint her nails. Every so often, you would knock on the door and ask if she was busy. Of course she wasn't, and offer to paint her nails. She sat in her indented spot on the beige sheets, and you sat right in front of her, stroking the brush as gently as you could, because you didn't know fingernails had a secret nerve that attached to breasts that would hurt her if you painted too hard. It was November when she died. You had spent her last few weeks. You had spent her last few weeks in the bed, uh, in the room to the right of yours. You spent a lot of time in that bed for the last few weeks, more time than you had within the past few months. You dusted off her copy of Coraline that she gifted to you for your 14th birthday and asked if she would be able to read the thing in its entirety to you. You have school in the morning, darling. Can I miss it? No, remember what Dad said. You didn't know what to say. Can I stay up late with you? She gave you that small smile where her cheeks looked like they were doing all they could to bring up her lips. Yes, but don't tell your father. Luckily for you both, he had fallen asleep on the couch that night. She read page after page, and it was as if you were in your own bed, clutching onto the covers as she sat next to you with her arm wrapped around your shoulder, book meeting her other hand, so you stayed sandwiched between her and the words, feeling like you were ten years old again. But you didn't feel like a kid anymore. You didn't want to be a kid anymore. You asked her if it would be all right if you read it to her, and she said yes. The book was planted in your hands a moment later, and without second thought, you read where she left off. What you don't know is that her eyes glossed over a few minutes into your reading. She was coming to terms with leaving you soon, and it was just as difficult as she thought. 
She realized that you would be okay and that although you were a person of few words, your heart spoke a lot of love. She didn't want to go to sleep that night, or any of those nights for that matter, because she was scared she wasn't going to hear the few light knocks that broke her out of her sickly trance. Thank you. Thank you. I love the use of a uh, second person in that piece. Um, next up, we have Sophia Haas. Hi. Um, I'm going to be reading a flash fiction piece called Softly, Gently, Softly. The second girl sweeps into arabesque, a sleep dancing marionette. Good, says Apolline. Good. Copper haired faces tilt towards her like sunflowers. There is no music here, only Apolline's sharp-tongued instruction and carefully meted praise. A meadow that rolls into tufted trees, sky sifting gray and pink. The third girl yawns her arms upward. The first bounces onto point. Higher, barks Apolline. One, two, three. One, two, three. Some time ago, Apolline crouched in the wet clay and molded these children, these daughters. She anointed them with slippers and flower-woven skirts. The first thing she taught them was to arch the toes, turn out the foot. They were pliable, obedient, loose-limbed, eager to spin after the sound of Apolline's voice. Their clay is drying now, their features solidifying. Soon they will wake. The fourth girl is the trickster. She is the one whose eyelids flutter, straining against their web-shut skin. She snags her searching hands on the bushes. Is she hoping to find a doorway, or does she, or does she expect someone to lower a hand from above? Call her up and away. No matter. The girl will learn. She must. As long as they dance, the meadow will bloom and the rains will come, and the clay will be ripe when it comes time for the girls to mold their own. Apolline looks at her own hands, caking in white splinters. She is the last of her sisters now, ash melting to dust, grave ceaselessly becoming womb. Thank you. Such a wonderfully mythical piece. Um, next up, we have Niles Jones. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, okay. So I'm going to be reading a poem titled The Birth of an Island. He didn't know the water could be gentle. As his body lay sprawled against the surface of the sea, he felt the waves' warm kisses comforting him. He could no longer see the ship that had carried him thus far, only the sound of the horn called out in the distance. The tone was mournful, and he wondered if the boat missed his presence. He had gotten to know the ship well and developed a kinship as one would with those one suffered with. Every night he was face to face with the wooden floorboards in the forgotten depths of the hold. In the morning, the ship was there with him as his naked body was tormented by the sun rays, charring his brown body into a crispy black. Now, as he lay within the sea, he clung on to the ship's calls until they faded into the distance. When the calls could no longer reach his ears, the silence that replaced it was forlorn, a reminder that rescue was unlikely and death inevitable. The others before him had already gone ahead their brown bodies floating around him like newly formed islands from underwater volcanoes. He stretched his arms out, hoping to touch any one of them, but the space between them was farther than he could reach. The gentle waves grew aggressive, like the men responsible for his presence on the ship, pulling at his life force as if it were disposable, as if it was there to be used until it shriveled up and lost its value. He did not remember their words, but he remembered the virulence of the whip as it cracked against his back, breaking his skin into pieces like ancient pottery. He cried out, his screams blending with those that came before him, but the pain never stopped, even after the whipping did. Food became scarce and hunger became constant, growing more aggressive like the tides. The waves rushed him now, submerging his body in one swift motion, making their former kisses feel distant, like the bliss of childhood. His lungs filled up with water, and as he lost consciousness, he decided to believe that his presence in the water was a choice, a final act of agency before he became an island. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we have uh, Loki Knaup.
That's good. All right. Hi, everybody. Oh, that's the wrong order. Um, I'm going to read for you uh, something of an abridged version of a short story. Um, it's called Tavern Tale, and I hope very much that you like it. Her teeth were sharp, and her patience long. She did not hold grudges, but she did not forget. She spoke to aged river rocks, and even if you wandered close enough to hear, your ears would fill with something like a good thick soap, and you would only see her mouthing whispered words to the water-smooth stones. They say she was a witch. They say she was not. They say that whatever she was, it was a pity. She was the only one who ever spoke to the bird. Because it flew, the people called it a bird, but they knew it was not. When it came to take someone away, they bowed their heads and prayed. Some prayed to gods they and their ancestors invented over centuries. Some prayed to the bird itself, pleading for mercy. Some prayed to nothing at all. Their neighbors prayed, after all. It seemed the thing to do. It was curious that no one thought of the fact that praying had not worked once. That was how things were in those days, in that place. Even she prayed. Even she had sense enough not to question prayer aloud, although she wondered at it many times. She did not bow her head. They wonder if that was why she turned out so peculiar. When she was a babe, instead of huddling close to her mother's breast, she opened her eyes wide and drank in the sight of the creature. Perhaps that was why her teeth grew in pointed. The image of the bird lived in her bones. They say she mourned when one of them was taken. Her mourning was not the same as theirs. When they mourned, they murmured solemn ancient words and sang songs in forgotten languages. They had no bodies to burn, so they would set a boat alight piled with sturdy tools and honeyed almonds and things they loved. They sent it down the river, down the river to the unknown lands, down the river to the speaking stones, though few believed her when she said they spoke. They sent it with weeping and singing and praying, always praying. She did not weep, she could not sing, she dared not pray, not when the bird was too far to hear. She had her own ritual, performed alone. When the last of the procession left the river, she went with silent steps to an eddy she knew well. It thought her a friend, or if not a friend, at least a companion. She thought it somewhat dull, but there was comfort in that. She spoke to the eddy, and she spoke to the rocks beneath, and she lay at the river bank, a leather book, the pages still fluttering in the breeze. She tilted her head back to the sky, gave thanks, and fell too. She was voracious. At the end, the binding was all that was left, aside from a few scraps of paper fluttering to the ground. Fine cuts lined her palms, black ink stained her tongue. She looked skyward, dark eyes, the irises nearly invisible, and her bloody mouth open in something that might have been awe, and might have been shame, and might have been an innocent question. This was her sacred daily bread. She ate alone, or with the dead. Thank you. Thank you so much for that piece. Um, next up, we have um, Elliot Metcalf. The tall people are ruining it for all of us. <laughs> um, I'm going to be reading a section of a short story called Monday Morning. Court cases are public record. It's still a limited amount of information, of course. Privacy laws exist. But they're out there, so long as you have the basic starting info and the nerve to look. I volunteer at Green Haven Shelter, whose entirety of background checks amounts to a little box you check off on the application if you're a convicted felon or not. I'm not much of a talker to the other volunteers, because most of them come and go easily once they realize the job involves the rear end of a cat just as much as the front end. Ada is my one confidant or, well, I'm her confidant, because she talks and talks, and the cats and I are in a silent game to see who's the better listener. She'll cradle Cosmo or Jangles in her arms, let them play with her brittle white hair, coo to them about her fights for sobriety and her worries for her daughter and how they'll go to good home soon, and then the two of us will scrub out the litter boxes and replace the food and water. At one point, I got myself a clipboard, which now sits at the front desk or in the crook of my arm as I survey the day's work and make sure everything gets done right. Ada does things right, and I do too. Anything done by anyone else has to be checked and checked off. All the cats need wet food, dry food, water, a clean litter box, and a wiped down living space. Cosmo gets no wet food. Mia is picky, she gets pate. There should be at least one toy per cat. 
If a cat is sick, they need the proper medicine for their specific ailment. All volunteers get their names searched on the state court system. Ada had drawn a misshapen cat in the upper corner and recommended I add head scritches as a requirement, so I did. Seb tries to tag along with the two of us frequently. He's a few years older than me with the first laugh I've ever considered irritating and a lack of proper work ethic. He leans over my shoulder when I'm trying to work with our resident feral cat, and with his beanpole physique casting shadows onto her cage, Mama goes mad. I end up with a long scratch on my palm. It's something called fear aggression, most common type of aggression in cats. The terror grips them and they bite the nearest living thing. Let Oliver alone, Zeb. Ada sprays Bactine on my hand and I curl my lips, expecting a sting that never comes. You know how Mama is. She's going to freak out more if you keep doing that. She was getting better, I mumble, but I'm too quiet. I just wanted to see what he was doing. Maybe I could try working with one of them, too. He gives me a grin that I don't like. Too eager. You'd mess up my progress. I take the gauze Ada offers and yank it tight around my hand. It's slow. You need a lot of patience. And the ability to actually clean a cage and not spread respiratory infections to half the cats here, but I don't say that. I'm patient. He beams, and I turn away. We need more dry food. Go get some from the basement, the blue bag, I tell him. He sags down like a shredded cat toy, but ducks under the door frame and heads out. Ada looks after him with a steady gaze, then back to me. Keep your chin up, sweetheart. The boss will listen to you and take care of things. She's just busy right now. I go back to wiping down Mama's cage, using my other hand this time. Now that it's just the two of us in this little corner of the shelter, her in her little back room away from the hustle and bustle of cats and customers, she's much calmer. She sits in the far back corner on her baby blue blanket, veiled in darkness from the unicorn patterned cover over her cage, staring at my every movement as I work. Her eyes swipe back and forth with the paper towels and spray bottle. I'm sure she knows how she wounded me, but I forgive her. It wasn't her fault. And although she's not saying sorry, she's not doing it again, and that's all I need. You could have a good home, I say to her. I'd make sure they're good to people, and no one will hurt you again. I don't know if anyone hurt her. No one knows. But something about her lingers with me, a familiarity I don't want to recognize. Not in her, not in me. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Ryan Parizo. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> like I said, my name's Ryan. I'll be reading a short fiction piece called The In-Betweens. I stood to leave the cafe, gathering up the sullied napkin and empty ceramic mug that constituted the remnants of my lunch. She stayed seated. Are you coming with me? I said. No, she said. I don't want to do this anymore. Her voice wavered only slightly. Do what? We haven't seen each other in years, I said. But I knew what she meant. I felt it too, bubbling up, churning in my stomach. I wanted to throw up. She placed her to-go cup on the table, her fingers idly spinning it in circles. I took a step further away, expecting her to say something, anything. Wait, not yet. Don't go. I set my foam-crusted mug into the bin and crushed my napkin into a tiny ball, rolling it around in my palm. I sat back down, still clutching the crumpled napkin. Are you sure? I said. She didn't look up from the slow twirling of her cup. I mean, you even said, what was all that then about destiny and fate intervening at the perfect moment and the universe pushing us back together in kitchenettes or whatever? I felt my cheeks flush as I spoke the words. Her cup stopped spinning. Kismet, she said. Yeah, that. What happened to that? You don't even know what you're saying. I laughed. Do I ever? You know me better than that by now. She finally tore her gaze away from the cup and looked up at me. I wished she hadn't. Her full face held a new softness, not that of warmth or compassion, but pity. The ever so slight pull between her eyebrows, the misty sheen of her vibrant brown eyes. She looks so small right now, far away, like a bird. You should go, she said. Only my hands moved, working to compress the napkin into a misshapen cube. You should come with me. You don't want that, she said. Not like I do. 
You don't know what you <clears throat> I don't know what you want, I said, sliding my chair back. That's the problem, isn't it? You don't know what you want, she said. You just want. I scoffed. She was right, of course. I just wanted. But it wasn't her, not really. I want you, I said. I want you to know that I... Why didn't you tell me? She interrupted. I could see a red hue had begun to overtake the pallor of her neck, threatening to burst onto her cheeks, culminating in tears and violence. Tell you what? I asked, steadying my own escalating heart. I wanted her to say it. I tried to appear calm and collected, allowing the napkin to soak up the sweat beating on my palms. Her phone buzzed, the muffled vibrations just loud enough to escape the confines of her winter coat. As she pulled it out, I slumped deeper into the wire frame of my chair. I fixated on the faux marble of our round table, the slender gray cracks spidering out from a series of broader, darker ones. It reminded me of palm reading. While she spoke, I traced what I thought to be the love line until it fell off the table. It didn't take long. Nearly all the faces in the cafe had been replaced with new ones since we had first sat down. I scanned each of them, at least the ones facing me. They were all so fresh and hopeful and lively, and if they weren't, then they were sullen and decaying, utterly alone. There was no one in between. I wondered which of these we looked like, but couldn't imagine us as either. I love you too she said, hanging up the phone and sliding it back into her jacket. Everything all right? Yeah, she said. The red had subsided from her skin while she'd been on the phone. It was just Dan. I'll have to go soon. It's probably for the best, I said. We shouldn't do this anyway. I stood up again, my chair scraping against the awkward tile floor as I forced it snug to the table. Wait, she said. Just sit back down, please. I said. Can you just answer me this one thing? I nodded. Why didn't you tell me about her, she said. She's my daughter, too. Why didn't you visit when you had the chance? Her jaw tensed, clenching and relaxing, as she stared down at her cup again. I jammed my hands into my pockets. We sat in silence as the midday rush filed into the cafe, each one of them desperate to avoid the afternoon lull. I scanned their faces, too, these intruders, as they waited in line, each of them drifting between apathy and oblivion. I wanted to smack their hands, to scream at them, to wake them up and show them the world of the living. I wanted them to see each other in all of their meaningless glory, yet they lingered in the space between existence and ash. I wanted them to pick a side. I never should have left, she said. This never would have happened if I'd stayed. We could have been a family. We could have, you're right, we could have been a family, I said, but we weren't. Instead, we were nothing. You were never anything to her, and now you never will be. She stopped moving, knitting her brow in the manner of deep concentration. What do you want from me? Seriously, I said, fighting to keep my voice level. Is it forgiveness or an apology, or do you want me to lie to you and say it's all right, that the past never happened, and if we run away together right now, it'll be nothing but rainbows and butterflies? Because that's not how it works. I know, she said. I know that's not how it works. Just, I, just need to, <clears throat> I just need you to tell me why you didn't tell me, and then you'll never see me again. I promise this time. I didn't tell you because you aren't, weren't a part of her life. She never knew anything about you, and if I'm being honest, I'm glad she didn't, I said. I'm glad she died before me, she met you. Her soft face contorted into a truer stone than our faux table had ever dreamt of being. You're a terrible person, she said. And you, <clears throat> and you should see where she's buried. But then we're done. Done. She lingered on the word, letting it fall from her lips like a bird too young to fly. I could have watched it hit the floor, but I didn't want to look. I closed my eyes. So you're still not coming with me then? We should go, she said, standing. Then we won't be anything either. Naturally. I threw away the napkin on her way out of the cafe. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, Ryan. Next up, we have Ariana Taylor. Hi, um, I'm going to be reading the beginning of a short story of mine titled In Holy Matrimony. Your husband was a simple man with simple pleasures. You were also simple, or at least you were raised to be. 
Mother had polished your lips with red wax and trained her little girl to be the prettiest and most obedient spouse. Such a perfect color, she would say, as she gripped your chin in the small confines of your powder room. She swiped the lipstick across your face with oblivious subtlety. Your husband was a fan of your soft-spokenness. From the ripened age of 13, you realized that your mouth was not your own, neither was your cadence. You were an envelope. That crimson grease paint steel acted as the barrier between your teeth and the ears of others, a shield encasing the letters of your desire. Your words would never reach past your own tongue. You were a connoisseur of silence, just like you were born to be. Your husband was a veteran. Mother liked that. Oh, a patriot, she swooned. Your fate was tied with her approval in champagne flutes, a small gold band with a gentle gem. You had met the man in the fall, and as the colors faded into winter chill and re-emerged into springtime, you were wed. The ceremony was small and quiet, just like you. Your husband was nice, nice enough, or at least in the beginning he was. Together, you purchased a small house, one with carpets that had an orange tinge to them. Together, the two of you walked along the creaky floorboards of the one-story residence, the realtor leading your tour in an upbeat pitch. The wallpaper was bold, with blue stripes along the plaster of the guest bedroom. You didn't enjoy the color of the cabinets, but you didn't tell your husband this. He didn't ask, either. He shook the salesman's hand, and later, it would seem as if Mother supported his choice. Such a wonderful place to begin your family, she had said, hanging onto his arm whilst you pushed the trolley in a department store downtown. You got to pick the porcelain plates, and you chose white ones with small oxide daisies along the edges. He and Mother picked the rest of the items that would make your home. Together was an odd word for you to understand. Family was, too. Your husband had loud footsteps. For you, who were silent, were well versed in taking note of sound. You had a knack for recognizing his moods based off of the soles of his feet. He would return home after five, loosening his tie and sniffing the air, gauging what it was that you had made for dinner while he was away. You would wait, seated at the table, sometimes on the love seat, always quiet and listen to how roughly he would make his way to greet you. When his footsteps were cordial, he would kiss your cheek. Other times, he would not. You did not know which one you preferred. Your husband had a love for tools. You didn't understand this adoration, especially because he would never use them if your overflowing backyard shed was any indication. During evenings sat in the living room, he in his recliner and you on the couch, he would mutter small questions regarding adverts for drills or hacksaws in the paper. What do you think, hon? Seems like a good deal, he would ask, eyes casted downwards on the pages and a glass of scotch on the side table. You would keep your gaze on your own magazine, an edition of Better Homes and Gardens. Maybe you could put the shovel your husband bought a few weeks ago to good use. You would lay your fingertips against the sides of the pages, periodically lifting your eyes towards the television as it aired the new showing of The Twilight Zone. You thought it was interesting the thousands of worlds within the franchise, each episode giving a new character the chance to escape fate. Your husband found it fascinating that the show didn't scare you, especially because nearly every program ended in death. Whatever you'd like, dear, you'd murmur. Your husband liked your body. You realized this fairly soon after you were wed. Bathed in the onyx glimmer of nightfall, he would ravish you often. The first time, when he deflowered you, you cried silently beneath him, throbbing thighs shaking. He did not take notice of your face, but instead kept himself upright on his knees as he gripped your virgin skin, mistaking your sobs as declarations of pleasure while he released. He was not smooth in his taking of you, and you would soon learn that this belligerent lust would continue nearly every night afterward. You phoned mother for the pain, and she advised you to soak in the tub to calm your muscles. That's normal, darling. Every woman hurts after her first time making love, she had said through the static of the telephone. You did not know how to tell her that this ache lasted far past your first time with your husband, that the pain never left, nor did the bruising along your hips from his unforgiving grip. You did not know how to tell her that the gnawing twinges of hurt seemed to seep into more than just your womanhood, that you could feel the same sting in your chest, your heart, and that you worried it would never leave for as long as your golden ring remained. You did not know how to tell her that you could not understand the phrase making love, and you thought that perhaps you were not born to. As you clutched the speaker of the phone to your ear, listening to mother recite the types of bath salts and aromas that would bring you the most ease, you wondered if perhaps she didn't really know what it meant either. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, our penultimate reader will be Ivan Vuong. I will, oh, I can't see. Okay, that's better. Uh, I will be reading a three-part poem inspired by Allen Ginsberg. One, when I walked down the broad, long asphalt avenues of Paris, I saw a parade of military men, endless wafting black plumage, and codes and cords and tassels glinting in hosmen tainted sun, where bombastic fanfare fed hungry hot bourgeoisie, where rifles bobbed in horse step time, where in broad daylight the maidens with their dresses and their mothers and the ballerinas rushed into the opera Garnier, where the men stood ogling on Italian white marble slabs and pointed their stimulated filed nails erect, where in the upper floors a particularly lecherous opportunist burst into the changing rooms penis first, where a stepmother traded her 16 illegitimate children for a crumb of social repute, where under the 14,000 glass bronze chandelier the ballerinas and the musicians found themselves unable to hear their own voices over the haughty chatter of the patrons. Where in the auditorium they never dimmed the lights because the show was never the main event. Where slobbering fancy garments slapped against Lutetian limestone. Where in the decrepit alleyways a butler fed her skin-wrapped baby the last of her milk and energy. Where outside the parade marched on and on and forever and ever and the boys ripped from their rural enclaves saw for the first time the 40,000 new stone facades built atop 30,000 bulldozed medieval ruins, where while heading to some imaginary front line, battle-hardened veterans shrunk away from the light and told them to stop. Stop where you're going because most of you will never come back. Most of you will either never come back or return home chewing a single piece of bloody bread. Two, and so I kept them walking, and the earthly scent of petrichor hung heavy, and by now the sky was a gentle gradient of violet and cerulean purple, and in the distance, war had colored the clouds with devilish fire, and I was safe, we were safe, and somehow the red glow of chaos was beautiful from afar. And in the dusk, I faced a corridor of Baroque pillars, cracked and worn, and the wind smelled of ash and ruin, but the air was clear and serene in a deep, deep brushing blue. And not yet scorched by the heat, the faded marble felt cold to the touch, oh, so cold, hug me close and warm me back a hundred years, a thousand years. And I could not turn the torrent of time and human domination, but I could love, and the air was crisp and tired and exhausted in all one breath. But I could tell my heart's furnace to churn. But we could only watch as the children and their mothers draped in their shawls and covered with everything they had left ran far, 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 far away from this place. Lights turning off, on and turning off, candles burning out, lanterns lining the hillside in solemn, impatient procession. One, two, three hundreds of thousands of lights in the opaque dark. For eternity in the day, we rest, watching the world experience repose perhaps anticipating the inevit inevitable fall. Flakes of you scattering away, fight, fight. Ribbons unraveling from us, bewildered in, in each other's eyes. We swim in fire, misplaced in time, smiling into the night. Three, clacka laka laka, softly are the chains. The steel-plated treads padded by the rubber shipped by oil cremating vessels at sea ripped from calloused, inflamed in Indonesian hands arrived prematurely and assembled hastily right behind the bombardiers and the dirty gas mass of the fallen. Avenge the fallen. Avenge the dying, the unprotected. Avenge the war heroes and the war criminals all the same. Klaka laka laka laka. Avenge the decaying president. Avenge the tattered flag. Avenge the dead man holding the shopping bag. Avenge the hospital of shrapnel mothers. Avenge the paper boy. The good Samar Samaritans. The bad Samaritans. Avenge the wasted oil, avenge, it, avenge the wasted flesh, the emaciated bone, the hunger stomachs. So hungry, the big man with wide shoulders sitting at the long table, swarmed warden of delusions. Hypotheticals and failure and failure and stress and stress and stress. Mini treads on bloodless cartography, clack -a -laka, laka laka Fragile, cannot easily be moved. Soldier, have your bread, your butter, your fingers, your toes, your helmet, your uniform, your insignia. Your guns, your knives, your confusion, your hatred, your buddy boots, your mountain of crunching skulls, your patriotism, your pride, your vengeance, your selflessness, your selfishness, your mother's eyes, your father's smile, your sister's lockets, your brother's little toy tank, and throat-gutted shell shock looked into mother's eyes that are not your own and not your life and not your country, and not how this was supposed to end, never how it was supposed to end. Thank you so much, Ivan. 
Um, I always appreciate the use of petrichor. It's my favorite smell. Um, our final reader of the day is Megan Young. Hi, um, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from a fiction piece titled Strange Hobbies. My new husband keeps his ex-wife on the best shelf in the attic. I call it the best shelf because he made that one out of an out of imported Purple Heart from Mexico or Brazil or somewhere for something like $14 per board foot. According to my husband, that's a lot of money for wood, which I take to mean the tree it came from is as endangered as it is durable. The shelf protrudes from underneath the semicircular window above his workbench and is the color of grape soda. Perched in its center is a little doll made of cloth. He shows me his collection after our wedding day and before we leave for our honeymoon. He takes me by the hand and unlocks the door at the end of the upstairs hallway, which I asked about back when we were courting. It was his workshop, he told me. What do you make? I asked. Guess, pumpkin, he said. He called me all sorts of names back when we were courting. Pumpkin and poppy seed and peppermint, cupcake, hot cake, baby cakes. He tried out names like shoes to see which ones would fit. I slipped into the ones I liked and burned the ones I didn't. Guess what I make in there, he said. I want you to guess. He fondled me with a potent sense of restraint, like how a large dog might carry a kitten. What do you think I make, sweetheart, he asked. He did not leave time for me to guess. I make love, he said. It was my penchant for these kinds of corny theatrics that convinced me to marry him. He presents his collection to me with an uncharacteristic lack of dramaticism. There is a hesitance in the way he leads me to his workbench and says ta-da and gestures to the Purple Heart shelf. Sitting in a row are a series of fabric dolls with rough seams down the centers of their round faces. The stitchwork is uneven. Their clothing is patched together into rough approximations of dresses. Their faces are drawn on by marker with lines that bleed onto surrounding threads. Their textile skin is tumorous where too much stuffing has been forced into one joint or limb or throat. They are handmade and it shows. I am struck by a profound sense of embarrassment. There is a swollen discomfort in the way my husband is looking at me, uncertain, like a child presenting his work to a school teacher. I smile and say, oh, wow, lovely. Yeah, he says, hopeful. He says these ones in the middle are the ones he made. To our left and right are more shelves, these ones colored normal oak, each displaying their own menagerie. I see bisque dolls, ball jointed dolls, wooden dolls, plastic dolls, rag dolls, apple head dolls, corn husk dolls, and matryoshka dolls. In a pat basket I see a collection of reborn dolls, their infantile, infantile faces pinched and threatening tears, so lifelike I am fooled for a blood curdling moment. I'm a collector, my new husband says. Oh my, I say. <laughs> I'm a collector and a maker. I can see that, I say. Do you like it? The doll in the center of the purple heart shelf is looking at me. One of her marker ink eyes is noticeably larger than the other, granting her countenance a bewildered quality. Her lips are drawn pursed in a deep maroon. Her hair is so black its sheen is violet under the midday sun. She wears a red dress with a fur-lined collar that reminds me of the dress I wore on our wedding day. My husband has drawn two concave lines at the neckline. Cleavage. Who's this, I ask, leaning forward over the workbench. I like the dress. I feel him place a hand on my shoulder, tentative and defensive, anxious I might try and touch or try and laugh. The uncertainty betrays the size of his hands, which are usually so forceful. I oblige and stop where I am and squint at the doll. There is a small tear in her underarm. Her hair cascades over her shoulders and into her lap, behind her back until it pools onto the purple heart shelf. I stare at her, bewildered. She stares back, equally bemused. That's my saffron, my husband says, and the pride lacing his throaty tenor is enough to convince me that I do not want to be married to him anymore. Saffron, I say. Isn't that the ex-wife? That's her, all right, he says. That's my Safi. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, that's all we have for today. A final reminder to sign up if you haven't. And one more round of applause for everyone.